am Andrea Butcher, and this is Being at Work. Being a leader is hard. So on this show, I set out to talk with experienced leaders to learn from their pivotal moments, how they led through the challenges we can all relate to but are often unheard. Today's story comes from Philip Mann, Senior Facility Leader at Macy's. Philip manages a large operation and works to connect with his team and the people within his group. He understands that knowing people personally goes a long way to support their productivity. Listen in to Philip's emotional journey as he shares how he rebuilt his team from the bottom up. Tell us a little bit about your journey into the role you have today at Macy's. Don't go too far back because it will take all day. I'm that old. So been in logistics supply chains since 1987 when I joined a small company called Big Five in California out of college. And then from there, I went to Target stores, worked in the Target facility for five years, and then uh, made a quality of life choice and moved to Mississippi, which is interesting, with another company called Thomas & Betts. That was a short stint. And then to FedEx Supply Chain. And from the FedEx Supply Chain, we, uh, I went to a company called Newark. And that role um, was recruited to a company called Big Sporting Goods. And then landed then at uh, Macy's, where I am today. And that leads us to a, a kind of defining moment in your career when you joined your current team. I know there were a lot of challenges Tell us about what that was like for you and how you led through that. So I'm not, I'm not the Six Sigma guy, right? I'm not the finance guy. I'm an organizational person. But um, in coming here, the building had been open for six and a half years. And I didn't know all the history, but found that there was a cultural breakdown that was present. And it was um, articulated uh, from a, my first contact with two people for almost three hours in one place. It was, it was overwhelming uh, to learn what was happening. Then we learned through some engagement feedback just what the damage was and through some facility-wide debriefing with every colleague led by myself and a counterpart. We wanted to understand what, what examples they had to inform the questions that were being asked in the survey. And uh, it's disheartening, but it was real. Um, people come to work, in my opinion, to either come in, punch the clock, go home, or to seek to find purpose, add value, connect with others, and be, be a part of a vital company, a vital organization. So after going through that debrief, we realized we were in for a real fight. In the nature of direct-to-consumer, it's a very spiky business. We add 3,000 people to our roster every fall. And uh, so that then the cultural side becomes a, an exponential exacerbating climate of dysfunctionality. After that full first season, my counterpart and I settled down and the senior lead of the building um, was moved to another facility and they offered me the corner chair. And that's where the work began. It was uh, February of 2014. Um, some collaboration with senior leadership to help them understand what I experienced and what was present here in light of what their expectations were of the building to deliver results, uh, we, we came to agreement. It was a painful path. Uh, but my senior leadership um, here proved themselves to be trustworthy by the commitments they made, the resources they delivered. And we began the work of rebuilding by connecting with people on week-by-week, month-by-month chats, um, one-on-ones, um, and then chart in a course of what you said as a colleague, this is what we did to build and establish credibility and rapport. So we get street cred uh, for being vital with them. So that then set course a place where I could, with my team, establish a vision for the business and what it would mean for us to be successful. And uh, once again, um, spent some time in collaboration with my senior leadership um, and then went to my leaders that uh, were working on the floor and dealt with the hard things, right? Setting expectations for roles and responsibilities, establishing a shared understanding of what their experience has been and what it should be, and what defined appropriate and what was inappropriate, what presented um, to people as a dignified engagement versus an indignant response, and began to help people understand that as leaders, we have an enormous responsibility for people. And uh, once we understand and view people as highly talented and gifted 
needing help to vet their performance, their role, what their deliverables are to their, their commitment to a company, um, we began to set and establish some traction. Uh, managers having credibility with their supervisors, um, directors having credibility with their managers. We stabilized the team. There had been 67 executive turnovers in six years. And we were able to slow down attrition, uh, establish um, a, a sound concept of what we wanted to do as leaders in the business and what we thought the art of the possible could be with our culture. And, um, and the game began. I was provided an excellent resource as a number two so that came in, um, a very deep individual, uh, was well-connected, had a tenure of 30 years with, with the company. So he knew the ins and outs of the politics, understood the nuances of, of the systems and technologies, the policies, the practices, and had been wounded by them, but also had been um, a huge, huge contributor to them. So that was an incredible piece of talent to have available. So, so you've mentioned several things that you did, and gosh, all of those I would love to dive into. You know, you building street cred by just talking to people, dealing with the right things. How did you determine, Philip, what to focus on first? Did you have a strategy? Did you have a plan? Did you just go to work? How did you prioritize given this the overwhelming nature of what you were up against? The feedback from the engagement survey was comprehensive. So it's both a score base and then they had written through keystrokes 75 pages of single-spaced comments, <laughs> right? Oh, wow. and, uh, and some were rather colorful. But uh, what we did is, and through the, the, the discourse and engagement of the survey debrief with the people who took the survey, the colleagues, there were three top areas. It was communication sucks. What, so it's what's good communication and how's that work? Um, it was favoritism and mistreatment. And then it was um, around um, being able to trust and integrity. So that's where I went to work. Took those three attributes and began to establish the idea through a, a mantra, it was, um, it was an acrostic that was developed by the leadership team once they understood the landscape, and it was called pride. So the word pride, which, as we know, pride serves, can, can cut two ways, one in a form of arrogance, or another that says you have an immense ownership in what you do and can be wrought with humility. Uh, so that word can be paradoxically positioned. But in this case, it was broken out to say pride is people respect integrity, dedication, and excellence. And uh, we began to then conduct ourselves at the end of every monthly meeting in the midst of a chat to say, you need to know that people deserve respect. And once it's understood that respect is present, you need to know that integrity must be present in order to a trusting relationship where candor can be present and not have a fear of recourse or retribution. Finally, as a result of that, if we know those things are present, it engenders a sense of dedication and fosters excellence. And um, through that, that vehicle, that acrostic, and some of the tools we employed that were provided by the business and the engagement survey, casting a, a clearer vision because we all know that for lack of vision, the people perish. And I have to tell you, it was a death trap. So you're transparent all the way to the fore. What is the problem? Define it. What, what is the solution? Talk about it. Speak the vision so people have a target to look to and then connect the vision to the mission uh, by virtue of what's happening as a result of this vision casting. And, um, and that's largely how we worked it. But it was five years of some serious hard work. Yeah, and no doubt a lot of ups and downs along the way. You know, <laughs> yeah. And I want to dig into the – because, you know, on this show we're curious about, like, what keeps leaders going in those tough moments? Tell us about like a particularly challenging time within the five years and what was it that kept you going? That's funny. So um, it's not funny. It's actually visceral. Um, are you familiar with uh, the movie Braveheart? Oh, of course. And, uh, and that, uh, that actor, Mel, Mel Gibson on the stone, eviscerated, and he screams freedom. So pretty emotional leader. 
and forgive, forgive me, um, and uh, not only emotional, but uh, I think that people require a nurturing and that they know it's present um, and they know it's safe because they can be trusted, um, because the audience can be trusted and get there. But I walked into this business. I had gone through a pretty strong reinvent with my previous employer, um, but uh, I walked out of, out of my bathroom and January 9th, 2014, and looked at my wife and I said, we have a huge reload bill we have to pay, but I'm not going back here. And she looked at me and she said, uh, I know it's been hard. I said, hard? I won't fill in with the blanks with the rest of the banter. And she said, you need to go to work because your high call that you know is sovereign is for you to be there for people. And that's why you're there. I said, okay. So I went to work and I walked in the door and my HR director said, I need to talk to you. And I went, great. <laughs> really, again, shut the door. Oh, okay. Who am I going to have to terminate today? <sighs> right? And she said, um, you need to know they're going to offer you the job in the corner. And my answer was no. And I wept. I was tired. <clears throat> I couldn't see. She said, Philip, that's not the right answer. You need to define to them what you need and set the course of what you know resides in you to deliver this business to a place where it can go. And I know you can do that. Good partner. So uh, we talked for a little while. I composed myself and I walked out. And 14 days later, I got a phone call. And then the next senior leader came on site. And we had an incredibly robust dialogue around the condition of the business. And he extended the offer. And I said, okay, on the premise that you said you would help and you would get out of the way. Um, and take the bureaucracy out that will get this done. I said, yep, Philip. And he shook my hand. And from that point on, we ran. But uh, that was a defining moment because I, I was ready to check out. But you didn't. No, you know, I think it's important to understand that um, marriage is a conundrum in our culture right now. But uh, I made a vow 34, 33 years ago. It was a vow. And sometimes it's hard to stand in that. And I got to tell you, it was and has been. My wife's moved six times with me and I with her, <laughs> right? Three kids and a life journey. Um, hardship, of course, and beautiful joy. But she's like a prophet in my life. She, she knows that she calls me the marketplace evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> because my first step into college was in ministry and I got disgusted and stepped away from that and went into athletics and sports medicine and found myself in business. So, um, and this is what the root is. People need good leadership. And if they have it, people are incredibly, amazingly tenacious at striving towards an objective that they have a shared interest in. And the values that are being purported are demonstrably present then all that does is accelerate. Um, it's like feeding a fire with dry tinder. So uh, the building has regained its position in that and the community. It's, it's, it's literally the leader in the network in just about every facet. And it's not because of me. It's because of some incredibly talented people who are deeply steeped and gifted in math and analytics and process flow that trust what's happening is grounded in something that that's real and uh and they, they stand up in the storm so we have an army that's strong uh, a group of leaders out of the building um and continue to do so on a continuum like no other building has so it's quite a privilege and, and that's the joy of fighting the right fight and having the right support so five years this journey a, a lot of work a lot of leaning in, a lot of connecting and nurturing people. If you could go back now to that day when you chose to move into the corner office and give yourself advice, what advice would you give? So uh, there's a lot of uh, biblical elements in my, my life and leadership style. Are you familiar with the centurion when he went to, the, uh, to Jesus and was talking about a servant that need to be healed? And, and Jesus said, well, take me to him. And the servant, so the, the centurion said, no, I'm a leader like you. You're, you're a man of authority. I lead hundreds. When I say go, they go. When I say jump, they jump. He said, all you have to do is say the word. And I would say to myself, have faith. That's what I would say. Yeah, because look at you now. Hopefully reflecting as the sun as the moon. But uh, yeah, that's what I would tell myself. It's like Joshua, be strong and courageous. 
It's a worthy fight. Where people are present, the fight's worthy. Discouragement shows up. It takes two to dance. And fortunately, the two were an incredibly robust company that was patient with me as, as I was with them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and have been incredibly supportive and engaged. So as we wrap up our conversation, what, what is your biggest learning through this process? I think it ties back to challenge. You know, um, a solution is good for a time, but in, in a large community, we employ between 1,400 and 4,000 people. There are always aberrations and events that occur that, you know, with new personalities and other personalities, there's always something happening. And so as a leader, it's how do you sharpen the saw in a way that you're reinventing your leadership that while you're not stepping away from the original vision and mission, you're recasting vision that's updated and connected to and connects with the people and the business. And it's an incredibly accelerated growth machine in direct to consumer. So the dynamics are continual asks. You need to get better and faster, which we all know it's understood, um, but people need to understand that too. So I think the challenge is for me to look at my leadership, my style, the information I have within me, it's being more deeply steeped in understanding with knowledge, but knowledge is meaningless if you can't leverage it. So um, asking others to participate, it's, it's staying connected, Andrea. It's staying connected all the way back down to the floor. There's a song by Kansas that talks by a, about a, a king who gets disconnected and he becomes deluded in himself and why he's disconnected in the loop. We have to remain connected and not let the requirements and demands of the business take us away from the purpose of the business, the, or the thing of the business that make the business successful. And that's our people. Well, and so I think a lot of leaders can relate to that statement. We get caught up in the pressure to perform, the pressure to get results, you know, the short term nature of business today. So what advice would you give to leaders who really struggle with that? That's a big question. <laughs> I think you have to be in a place where you say, know thyself. And, and in knowing yourself, be humble enough to invite others to step in your life and, and bring critical insight and, bring, and, and respond with true humility. And true humility is one that says, I too should be taught. I'm not the master, just a man who has position and responsibility for you. But I, I think it's know yourself. And, uh, and don't get, do not get satisfied by a metric. Um, instead, I would say be satisfied with the dynamic of the beautiful relationships that generated that result and continue to walk in that relationship because that's where it, it stays. That's what makes it alive. They're done. When it's done at the end of the year, you walk away. It's done. But the presence of the humanity that's there, the relationship, it's still there. You can't abandon that. You have to stay there. Yeah, it never ends. Well, thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability, your openness. I so appreciate your emotion. Your heart is showing so clearly. If our listeners want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? There are two modes of electronic communication, phone and email, right? Either one works. I respond to both, um, although I think email can be dangerously monolithic. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer a phone conversation that, that, that reveals intonation and <laughs> other things. Um, it's pretty simple. It's PM32887 TM at Gmail. It stands for Philip Man and Tony Man, and those numbers are our anniversary date. And the phone number, uh, my mobile number is area code 724-562-5254. Great. Well there's some contact information for Philip Man. Thank you for being being a part of our conversation today. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast to never miss a Being at Work story.